Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks to everyone at Mule and, and Tight Pit uh, for the space and for all the help in setting this up. Um, as I was preparing uh, today's talk and thinking about what I wanted to talk about, um, I was looking over the things I've done in the past and trying to find that, that one area that I wanted to talk to. And I've, I've had multiple iterations in, in my creative professional career. I, I have launched a couple of companies, one on my own, one with partners. Um, I, I've been an artist. Uh, I currently work at the Exploratorium. And I'm trying to think of where, where to focus. And I get a phone call. Uh, and this is a true story. I, I get a phone call from a buddy in New York, someone I've known a long time. And he calls and he asks me, he says he, he has this idea for a, a website. And he wants to know uh, what to do. He's, he's struggling. Do I, do I launch a business? Do I just put this up? And I find, as I'm talking with him, I slip into a very familiar rhythm. This is a conversation I've had over the years many, many, many times uh, with folks who have ideas and they wonder what to do with them. Particularly those larger ideas, you know those ideas that, that gnaw at you, that, that you kind of find a way out and they feel big. They feel bigger than you and you, you feel compelled to do it. But there's a million and one ways to do it. How do you do it? Why do you do it? All of those questions. And as I was talking with him, I realized that um, not only have I had those conversations with uh, a lot of different creative types, I've had them with myself. And having these multiple iterations, there have been these points where I've been asking myself those very questions. And I thought instead of focusing in one area, that that would become uh, today's topic. And in doing so, I perhaps get to talk about my, my own work a little bit, share how I've wrestled with those questions. Um, I don't propose to have answers. Uh, I'd watch out for anyone who does say that they have an answer to you know, whether your idea is good or should you or should you not pursue it or how. But what I'm gonna suggest through today's talk is a, a series of, of questions that you would ask yourself, a series of considerations that you should keep in mind as you decide, uh, do you pursue an idea and if so, how? So starting off, you have an idea. Right? And again, it's that, that idea that feels interesting to you, compelling to you, perhaps bigger than you, and you feel the need to realize it. You're deciding if you should move forward with it, and you feel this, do I pull the trigger question? You know, do I do this, do I do something else? And you're, do I put time into it? What's the risk? And the most valuable thing to any creative person uh, is, is their time. So do I pursue this project? There's more than one way to do it. Right? Do I, do I just do one iteration? Do I produce it? Do I become a designer? Do I launch a design business? Do I become my own designer? What is the right path for your idea? So that's a question that a lot of people ask is, what's the right path for the idea? What does the idea say is the right way to go? But there's a more important question, I think, and that is, what is the right pathway for you? When you decide what to pursue and how to pursue it, often you think in terms of the idea itself, but what are your goals? What do you hope to get out of it? And that's kind of what I'd like to talk a, bit, a little bit about today in the context of of my own decisions over the years and what I've learned, where I've succeeded and where sometimes I've had less than success. So the first thing I would say is, to that first question is, keep in mind you're going to have a lot of ideas. Um, that moment where you have that big idea and it's consuming you and you feel that weight, that pressure of what you do with it or what you don't do with it, I think it's always important to remember that that's not the only idea you're ever gonna have. And don't give it more weight than you should. Believe in it, be passionate about it, but don't attach anything else to it. It's, it's one idea, it's, it's a special idea, but you're going to have more. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Over the course of my career, I'm gonna call out three different uh, periods for me. They're on the surface, separate, but there's ways in which they're connected. The first is Tobin Toys, which was the first toy company I launched when I was a, a, a little bit younger. Uh, Big Boeing, which was a company I launched with partners a few years later and then some of my current work as a mechanical artist. So this is where it all began for me. Now this is not gonna be a story where I talk about how I grew up barefoot on a dirt floor, <laughs> and I, I am not going to get all Kaczynski on you. But I call this up because this, this was called The Shed, and as a very young kid, this was the craft center at a very special camp I went to. And usually when you think camp, you think in terms of white, blue, and popsicle sticks. This uh, shop had a blacksmithing shop, a pioneer wood shop, candle making, batik, 
tie-dye, jewelry making, all of these different crafts. Um, and I just found that I took to it and loved it. And it was all about expression of materials and the tools and make whatever you want. And it had a real tinkering aspect and it had a pursue your own idea aspect. And a lot of my love of play things, of, of making things with wood, of just exploring ideas came from my time in this shed. And yes, it really was an old rundown hog shed that this camp had converted <coughs> into a craft center. But it's, it, it was a humble <coughs> shed, but inside what went on was incredibly creative and inspiring. And it's something that I've kept with me my whole life. So Tobin Toys. Um, I founded Tobin Toys uh, basically as a way to realize my own uh, creative ideas. Uh, I, I've always had an entrepreneurial streak, I think even before I knew what the word meant. But Tobin Toys was basically a way for me to say, these are the things that I make. I'm now going to find a way to make a living at it and produce them. And I want to come back to this because in some of the, the questions that you ask yourself when you're deciding whether you pursue an idea, particularly an entrepreneurial idea, is what are your goals? What are you after? And I think this is one of those areas where people are not always entirely honest with themselves. But it's important that you know. There's no right answer, but you should know uh, what you're after. And sometimes the goal itself can just be the realization of a thing, and that's totally cool. But be honest with yourself and know what you're after. And that's what I was after with Tobin Toys. I wanted to launch a company. Um, I had done my first toy already, which was called the Motion Factory. And this was basically a marble rolling toy. And rolling marbles has been a theme since I was a kid. I just love them. I, 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 there's something fascinating about simple toys in motion. That actually was the mission of the company. Um, it was a running joke in the family that I would recite that mission constantly. And my whole family could say, we at Tobin Toys believe that in this technical age, da, 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 da. And, you know, we make light of it, but it, it, it was important, and those, those goals, those missions, they guide your little decisions. Because it's, it's not so much, and this, I'll talk about this later too, when it comes to an idea that you have an idea and then it's done, or you have now had it so you're good. It's borne out by a million little decisions, and if you don't have a sense of what you're after, why you're after, it makes those, the, those little decisions very challenging. Um, and knowing what you're after can always help. So this was the first toy I produced at Tobin Toys, and it was called Top Traps. And it was basically a, a modular spinning top toy where you could uh, uh, put little bowling pins around a maze, spin a top through, and it would knock them down, and you got to make the, the maze however you want. And a running theme in my toys was I always wanted them to be open-ended. I always wanted them to be uh, uh, crucibles for creativity, not so much for myself, but for whoever is using them. And this was where I had one of my first big lessons uh, in Top Tracks. There's a notion that you, uh, there, there's certain mythologies around ideas and there's a notion that you have an idea, right? And then you stick to your guns and you bully your way. You bully that idea's way into the universe, right? And you do it by just standing <coughs> firm on, on what that idea is. And there's a certain truth in that, but there's also a certain mythology in that. This was my first attempt at doing that, where I said, this is the wooden toy that I want. It has to be made just so. It has to be this kind of material, this kind of size. And what ended up happening is I created a $50 toy that weighed about 10 pounds, and you know it, it, it cost too much to ship around the country, and it didn't do so well. And this was the first toy in my, my new company. Um, fortunately, I was saved by my next couple of toys, which are, are good, good counter examples, that they still embody the spirit of what I was after in the company but I had learned to take some real-world considerations into account. And these toys were Frigids and Stringamathing, and Frigids was, uh, was indeed a success and is still on the market. Uh, Frigids was a rolling uh, ball maze, a Rube Goldberg machine that went magnetically on your refrigerator, and Stringamathing was uh, kinetic art for your walls. Imagine a bunch of pulleys that you would stick on the walls and you'd put little paper doodads on them, and you'd pull uh, a, a string, and your whole wall would, would be in motion. And it even had in it a... Uh, a little attachment you'd put on a light switch, where this was before your iPhone. So you could pull a, you could pull a, a ball on one end of the room, it, the string would go all around the room, and a little contraption would turn your light switch off and on. Awfully fun for an eight-year-old kid. So these two toys did well. Um, fortunately, right as the other one wasn't doing so well, and I, I had a company. And um, there's a couple of things I'd like to say about these two toys in the in the creative process in the context of ideas being done at the moment of conception and how you launch an idea. Uh, the first is, string the thing, 
it actually started off as a contraption. It did not start off as you know, kinetic art for your walls. You know, wanted some way of being able to manipulate your whole universe through string. And that was the goal. Well, there weren't that many things in a kid's universe you could manipulate with string. There was the light switch, which we kept in, but suddenly realized as we were playing with it that um, the pulleys themselves were kind of cool. And at some point, through a tinkering process, we were cutting out things and putting it on the pulleys, and that became the idea. Um, and that's how the product ended up becoming what it was. And so the, the, the message in there, part of the takeaway, particularly cycling back to this concept of, of what you do with your idea and how you pursue it, that idea that you think you have, you don't. You don't have it yet. You have the start of the idea, but where it goes, you don't entirely know yet. And what I'd like to suggest is that moment of go or no go, it's not so binary. It's not a matter of pulling the trigger. It's going to be a series, again, of decisions that you make. So start prototyping, playing, iterating, and see where it goes, as opposed to standing back and saying, I'm going to figure it all out, and then I'm going to be off to the races as soon as I have it figured out. Frigids, um, similarly, uh, there, there's an old um, uh, partner of mine, a good friend, Joel, and he has an expression uh, that there are many levels of doneness. It's a great expression. And Frigid's was a great example of that, where it, it did stay mostly as that idea, uh, but the idea wasn't entirely ready. I had grander notions about how many different widgets would be on the fridge. Remember, I've been making marble contraptions since I was a kid, so I had a, a bunch of different ideas of what should be on the fridge in order for it to be a complete toy. And if I don't put it in there, then, oh my gosh, somebody's going to knock it off before I get out there, so why do it in the first place? In the end, I ended up with just chutes and buckets and bumpers and put it out there. Um, and I had people hammering pieces together the night before it shipped, and we just did it, and it worked. So this, this notion also that you, you have to have the idea just right before you go, again, iterate and get it out there and try. And I do have in here, um, I can show if it works. <laughs> hmm. And this video, by the way, I pulled off of, of YouTube. Most of the videos I'm showing today, if I have time, they're just people using the product. And I always take great joy. That last part I love, and it again suggests something that I uh, makes me proud of a toy I've created and something I'd look for in other toys or any product, which is somebody using it in a way in which you didn't intend. Uh, I think that's great. It, it's a sign that there's, there, it's open-ended enough that there's, there's room for somebody else to express their own creativity. Honestly, it never crossed my mind that this toy would cross around to the other side of the fridge. And I love <laughs> so. Um, I want to pause here for a moment. After uh, I created this body of work, I sold the company. And that's an interesting moment. And it, in, in thinking about today's talk, I was reminded of, of two pieces of advice I got from my father around Tobin Toys. Only two pieces of advice I got. He was a brilliant guy, not much of a businessman. Um, when I was launching the company, he looked at me and said, you're crazy if you launch this company. Three years later, when I said, Dad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell the company, he said, you're crazy if you sell this company. <laughs> now, I didn't follow his advice either time. <laughs> but looking back, uh, in hindsight, he was right both times. And it's interesting. How could he be right both times? That uh, you know, launching this company was crazy and selling it was crazy. And I think that, again, cycles back to your goals and, and the import of doing something that fulfills you. Um, so launching a company, anyone here who's creative and has tried to, for lack of a better word, monetize their ideas or make a living off their ideas, you know that natural tension between your, your creativity, uh, this, this notion of the pure creativity, if such a thing exists, 
and what it takes to realize it in the real world and all the stuff that goes along with it. Um, so in launching the company, this particular company, I was naive. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Um, I think my father knew, um, but I did it anyway. And I didn't do it because I wanted to run a company. I did it because I wanted to realize my ideas. And that's not a reason not to do it, but again, it's important to be conscious of that because you should know what you're getting into to as, as much as you can. Um, and when it came time to sell it, I think implicit in, in his advice not to sell it was his sense that I wasn't clear entirely about why I was selling it. Um, when I started it, I did have a business plan and it said sell this company. But I think I did it because I didn't necessarily want to do all of those other things that went along with having a, a company. I like to have my ideas. I wanted to be an inventor, you know, sales, uh, production, uh, logistics, all of these things, money, finance, raising capital, all these things that go with it. Um, they're not necessarily about inventing toys. They're something else. Um, and you have to, if you're going to undertake it um, and make that your focus, part of you should like that, um, or at least accept that you're going to be doing it. Um, so this is an interesting transition point for me because I sold that company and somehow, two years later, I found myself doing it again. <laughs> I launched another toy manufacturing company and I had an interim period in between where uh, I did start some of my own art, which I, I, I'm going to come back to, um, and I did some, some consulting and I was licensing ideas. And in the toy business, before we talk about the next company, it's important to point out that there's, it's one of those few industries where it's set up to receive outside ideas. You know, this notion I'm going to be an inventor and have an idea and sell an idea. The toy business is set up for that. Not many are, where you have hundreds or thousands at one point of inventors running around the country with their ideas. Some design firms where basically you come up with an idea and you pitch it to a manufacturing company. And these manufacturing companies are structured many times such that they can take these ideas. They'll even sometimes in the large ones have a person whose sole job is to review outside ideas and determine which ones they should bring in-house for production. So this next company uh, was a, a larger initiative and it wasn't just me, which was another big learning experience. The first company was just myself. This company I launched with two partners and we even brought in a fourth later on. All of us had had, had uh, our own success in, in the past. Um, and got together to launch Big Boing. And at the outset, um, because of our past and because of these notions of what you want to do and how you want to spend your time, we actually went back and forth in the beginning as to what this company was going to be. Um, are we a licensing company? Are we an idea generation house? Are we an incubator? You know, I think it was early enough that that wasn't a dirty word yet, those of you who were around me. <laughs> Great business model, an incubator. Um, or are we a toy manufacturing company? Or are we another manufacturing company? We, we weren't necessarily just toy guys. One partner was very interested in candy. Another was very interested in housewares. And we had different ideas. And we actually spent some time straddling that fence between idea generation and trying to sell ideas and actually doing the manufacturing. It eventually moved uh, for a good period of time into toy manufacturing. It was what we knew. Um, and. And we did have a lot of good ideas and notions and strengths in that area. And I think that's another thing to consider uh, when you're, you're deciding how to pursue an idea or whether you should, is know your strengths. And I'm also not saying this to say only pursue those things that you're, you have strength at, but don't pretend you're strong in something that you're not. You can learn it, but know that you're on that learning curve. Um, and we made that mistake uh, a couple of times. So this company, um, for me personally, it was an expansion of, of our, my materials palette. I had been making wooden toys since I was a kid. And in this company, we, we produced toys that were plush, electronic, foam, plastic. Uh, we were mass market in addition to specialty market. The first was a smaller company. So there was a lot of learning going on. And for me, speaking personally, I like that. I love being on that learning curve. And I think that's true of a lot of... Uh, creatives, and it, it's particularly true of, of entrepreneurs, and it's super particularly true of creative entrepreneurs. So that that being on that that steep learning curve, where you're learning something new, is wonderful. And if that is something that drives you, it's also important to know that that's what you're seeking out. So this was a toy called Get Ups, which was basically a wearable plush with electronics in it. It was a uh, uh, a uh, hat and, and shoes were basically if you were a dinosaur and you stomped around, you know, you get the, the clippity clop, clippity clop in the feet, and if you tilted your head back, you'd get a whinny, you know, and a, you know, that kind of sound. 
there were years where I was practicing that. <laughs> uh, we also had a dinosaur with the, the stomp, stomp, stomp sound and the roar when you tilted your head back and, uh, uh, and the, the fairy costume where it would twinkle, 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 twinkle as you ran around and had a wand with a bring. And uh, this company was started by three guys. And there, there were moments where we were running around the office wearing this, uh, <laughs> this fairy costume, but you know, fortunately that was before YouTube. So we had another toy called Bath Time Adventures, which was a way of tricking out your bathtub uh, and theming it out. Um, and these next couple of toys, um, I want to linger on this one for a second. I want to talk for a brief, brief moment about the, the origin of ideas. Again, talking about this notion of where, the, where ideas come from. Uh, in part, our decision to do bath toys came from Walmart. And that's not exactly a, uh, uh, a pure I idea of where the creative idea is from, if your muse is Walmart. But let me, <laughs> let me explain. So we're forming the company and we're deciding what to do. And uh, one of my partners, or a rep, I can't remember, talked with one of the buyers. And they said, we're interested in bath toys. OK. Walmart says they're interested in bath toys. We're launching a company. What do you do with that? And because Walmart said they wanted bath toys, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be a good idea. It doesn't mean it's not going to be a, a, an original or authentic idea. Um, what we did with that is we fed that into our tinkering process, our brainstorming process. We would play in the shop. We would basically do what we did as if the idea were our own. And we wouldn't move forward with any idea that we didn't think stood on its own. Um, we didn't come up with it just because Walmart said they wanted bath toys. We came up with it because we believed in it. We just kind of fed that criteria into, one of the uh, in, into the creative machine. And had we not come up with something, we wouldn't have pursued it. But we did. And this was a suite of toys that I'm particularly proud of called Tub Tunes. And this comes back to uh, something else I mentioned, which is playing to your strengths. Boy, this played to all of our strengths, and it became a, a great toy. Um, it was basically musical instruments for the tub. Uh, it was, it was open-ended. The first toy was water flutes, which came out of an idea in a brainstorming session where you say, what, wouldn't it be cool if you were in the tub and you had uh, test tubes that you could fill with different levels of water and blow across the top and make different sounds? And that turned into a full-blown instrument um, and a suite of instruments um, that teach young kids the fundaments of music. And we had kids doing everything from the fundaments of music to actually playing Beethoven. Um, and it was a great toy. And I, oh, wait, before I go to that one, I'm on a Mac, so, and I don't know how to do this, so I can't zoom in. But if you look in the bottom left, you'll see the, one of the early prototypes of the drum. And this, again, goes back to the, the physical, tangible prototyping process that we went through. We were, we were playing with this in the shop. Chris so this is one of the first, the first pieces we made. All right, so this is going. Yay! I found this online. Oh, this is somebody using a later version of Tub Tunes and a trumpet. Standards. And I just get a kick out of this, so I'm going to share it. <laughs> Note this is not a three to five year old. So um, I just got the knot on time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move through uh, as quickly as I can. Um, I, I just love that because there's something incredibly authentic about it. I never thought that that's what was going to happen with that toy. Um, and clearly, he has uh, no ambiguity about what his goals are. And, <laughs> and he's just doing his thing, and I love that. So Super Fort was one of the last toys we did, which was basically... Uh, uh, a modular constructible fort building kit made out of extruded PE foam noodles. Um, you could make a fort out of a submarine, uh, into a submarine, a car, a plane, a spaceship, whatever you wanted. Um, and this was a great toy and a real collaborative effort. Um, 
I would not stand up here and say I was the only creative uh, at the second company. I, I wouldn't even necessarily say it in anything I've done. That's a whole separate talk that you, the, the, the lone gunman theory of creativity, I don't entirely subscribe to. Um, it was a big creative effort by a lot of folks and it was one of our most successful toys. We sold that company too. <laughs> And I think in part because, again, of that, that dialogue that I mentioned at the beginning as to what we wanted to do. Do we want to have ideas? Do we want to just do toys? Um, I think both times, even where um, we, in both of my companies where we wrestled with how you want to spend your time and what you want to do, I was fortunate enough that the toys that we created were successful enough that we could sell uh, and move on to other things. And that happened uh, both times. So that left me again saying, how am I doing on time? Wrapping it up, okay. So I'll, I'll go through this briefly, which is my current incarnation uh, in my own creative pursuits as, as an artist. Um, I, I love making things, and as, if I, as I've answered these questions for myself, I don't dislike a product. I like it. I don't dislike launching companies. I like it. Um, in all likelihood, I will probably launch another one. Um, when I follow my own advice and, and have the, the right idea and have faith in how it will fulfill me. Um, but right now, I'm, I'm spending my time creating one-of-a-kind kinetic playthings that I'm calling art. And really, these are just like the toys I used to make in that, that shed that I showed in the beginning. They've just become a lot more sophisticated. Um, and I, I have the tools and materials now to do all kinds of neat, complicated things, including, as I run through, um, a clock that tells time with rolling marbles, um, outer is uh, minutes, inner is hours, and this is something I wanted to make ever since I was a kid, and I just love taking the time to make this one thing, knowing that I don't have to make 100,000 of them afterwards. And I can just do it the way I like. Um, ironically, I still have habits from the toy biz that I cannot give up, where I create this in SolidWorks, and if you wanted to scale that up, and there were 100,000 people who would pay what that costs, I could do it. <laughs> but I, I don't know if the market is there for that. Um, I've done installations uh, at, uh, that are open-ended again and participatory and this was at a Bay Area Discovery Museum where again I created a large toy that basically has a bunch of kids in it as opposed to playing with it. Um, and I'll show quickly a slice of this which is a mechanical uh, pixel display that uh, tells time with uh, uh, kind of our fellow pieces, black one side and uh, white on the other. And this again is a, a, a contraption that is just something I wanted to make. And cycling back to the goal, you know, the goal doesn't have to be uh, money, but if it is, you should be clear about that. Um, in this case, it was the joy of making it for me. That's, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and the joy of sharing it with people, and hopefully they feel the way I do making it when they experience it. In the interest of time, I'm going to scroll ahead. Um, I'd love to play this one all the way through, um, but I will have it online if folks want to check it out. Um, and the final piece is one I just created, um, which is another mechanical uh, contraption, a scissor lifter that brings a marble up to the top over a period of many minutes with hammers that are reciprocating back and forth, driving a scissor lifter up to the top, which brings a marble up to the top, which comes down the swinging buckets and is really cool. <laughs> Is that good? That's good. That's All right, so can I, can I have one more minute? That's the end. One more minute. And I'm going to scroll past this. All right, I want to wrap it up. So just in summation, partial summation, remember you're going to have many ideas. It's not the only one. You're deciding whether you should move forward with it. Careful of the word should. It's not necessarily an either or decision. Test it, prototype it, iterate it, bring it into the world, and see how it goes. Which path is right for you? Know your goals, be honest about your strengths, and do, do whatever fulfills you. 
and I'd like to close there.